Welcome to Take a Side, sports talk show that lets you, the viewer, choose our winners. As always, head over to Sided.co and the Sided Debates app for your chance to take home a $25 Amazon gift card. Shout out to last week's winner, Football Guru, for his win atop the Sided leaderboard. We've got a great show for you today. After last, last night's college basketball national championship game, we've officially reached the end of the college basketball season. Kansas men's basketball has already made a number of moves, adding 2021 guard Bobby Pettiford and Division II All-American Cam Martin. The Jayhawks will also be bringing in early signees K.J. Adams, Zachary Clemens, and Sidney Curry. However, to make room for these additions, a number of KU players have already entered the transfer portal, including Tyon Grant Foster, Tristan Enyarunya, and Jethro Muscadin. I'm joined now by Blake Sevenbergen and Max McElroy to debate on if next year's KU basketball team will be better than this past year. Yeah, so I think it's as simple as this, exactly what Jacob said. The guys that are leaving Kansas basketball compared to the guys that are coming in, it's a night and day difference. I mean, Tyon didn't make a great impact. Tristan was hit or miss when he was in the game. Jethro didn't play at all. And now we've got guys coming in, a D2 All-American who scored over 50 points in a game and averaged 25 and nine. Are you kidding me? I want that on my team all day long. Absolutely, I, so I agree with what you're saying. I think talent-wise, KU will be much better next year. However, we're at a point now where what do you consider success for KU? What do you consider a better team? They're a blue blood program, so is that national championship success? Is that winning the Big 12? I think the Big 12 this year is, is gonna, this next upcoming basketball season is going to be loaded. You have Baylor has a top uh, nine in the country recruiting class right behind KU with a five star and then two four stars. You got a Texas team who's coming in and they're looking great. They have a great recruiting class with Chris Beard who is a phenomenal coach. And then Oklahoma now with Porter Moses, an awesome hire for them. They're gonna be in the Big 12. It's gonna be a, a, a brutal division and can, if KU can get out of that, maybe, but what do we consider, consider success anymore? Yeah, I mean, I can't disagree with you. Porter Moser, great coach. Obviously, Baylor's always good. I think the, uh, the teams at the lower level are going to be better, too. Iowa State's got a new coach. They're talking about how they're going to go recruit hard. But Kansas is ranked fifth nationally in recruiting and tops in the Big 12. I mean, it's, it's tough to beat that. Let's talk about Sidney Curry. He's a JUCO transfer, big guy. Comparisons have him playing similar style to Doak. I mean, Doak was great. And then Pop Bobby Pettiford, his comparisons are saying like he plays fast like Dot. He averaged 18 points a game and six assists in high school in his career. That's unheard of. And he averaged over two steals a game. Yeah. Nobody averages over two steals a game anymore. And he does that in his career in high school. That's, that's crazy. Yeah, He's going to be great for Kansas. Yeah, it's, it's going to be exciting getting all the new guys in there. It's going to be a very different team from last year to this year. But we're, we're at a point where it's just, again, in the Big 12, you have now all of these good teams are coming here. How successful will KU be compared to that? And honestly, love Bill Self. Everything Bill Self has done is great. His style of play is a little dated now with the, the way college basketball is now. So how, how successful, how long can they maintain that success for when you have all of these other teams who are playing fast, playing physical, tall, and, and lean, you know? Yeah, I mean, I agree. Bill Self's offense, obviously, a little outdated. But when he gets... Like when he gets the setup that he needs, the two bigs, a fast point guard, when he gets that, he's never had an unsuccessful team. I mean, we've got a big, we've got a stretch four now in Cam Martin. KJ Adams is a beast. He got bored and won a dunk contest last weekend. <laughs> it, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty cool. I watched the video of that. But what do you, uh, what, this is what do you consider success now? Because if you're talking about success, KU finished second in the Big 12 this year. You know, no slouch. They potentially could have won the Big 12 tournament. So, you know, what in terms of success, it's not like this year's team was unsuccessful, but I, the eyes, I have my eyes on just that national championship that Kansas hasn't had since 2008. Yeah, I mean, this year's team was around a 32 exit, and they got 30 balled by USC. Obviously not great, at least for tournament experience-wise. Next year's team, if they play to the talent that they have coming in, easily a top-five team, national title contender, one seed in the tournament type of stuff that this team can bring. And then... Not only that, with the guys that they already have coming in, they're still one of the top targets for Christian Bishop, who played and was a monster at Creighton. So I can only see the ceiling just getting higher and higher for this Kansas team. And them hiring Bill Self or re-signing Bill Self to a lifetime contract is, I mean, I think great for the university, great for the program, and I think it's only going to get better from here. Yeah, it really shows their commitment that they have to Bill Self, which I think is important to be able to have that, that much faith in your head coach. I think it'll be very interesting to see if, you know, with all the talent that KU will have next year, will that make a difference based off of the style of play that everyone else has gone into? I mean, you watch SEC basketball, it is fun, it is fast, it's physical, it's all very tall, very lean, and super athletic, and, you know, that's kind of the way that basketball has 
shifted over mm -hmm. the past few years. And so we'll see if, if Bill Self will be able to continue that and get, get KU with his style of play, get him as far as, you know, we want that national championship. Yeah, I and mean, obviously I know we're both super excited to see what's going to happen next. Next year's team should be great. This year's team was also great. Let, let's see what happens, and we will take it over to a commercial break. Why doesn't my skin look like theirs? Why is my nose so big? I'm never gonna look like those girls. Welcome back. With college basketball behind us, we can shift our focus towards Major League Baseball. One week into the season, we've seen some hot starts across the board. The NL West expects to be a dominant division this year with the San Diego Padres and defending champion LA Dodgers leading the way, while the NL East and Central should both be competitive as well. The AL has a loaded East division with the Yankees, Orioles, Rays, and Blue Jays expected to be contenders. Meanwhile, the AL Central and AL West both have some major contenders. I'm joined now by Marina Siever and Jack McGar to debate the best division in the MLB. I think, hands down, the most loaded best division in the MLB right now is the NL East. It's the Braves, the Phillies, the Mets, the Marlins, and the Nationals. Yeah. And the, the bottom, simple bottom line is there's not a bad team in that division. They will all contend not only to win the division, but they're all good teams. We're in a situation with the NL East where we could very well see the fifth place team still go 500, mm -hmm. you know? and that. I mean, like, I don't know how it gets any more black and black and white than that. All five teams are good teams. It's not only the best division, the most loaded division. I think it's the most exciting division to watch this season all around, all five teams. Um, and I just think it's as simple as that. I think when we're looking at the most loaded division, I think you have to look at the NL West when you have arguably the two top contenders for the championship this year in the Dodgers and the Padres. I really don't know how you can get more stacked or loaded than that. I mean, I really think when you have, when you're looking at loaded, I think you have to look at what teams, how many teams can actually vie for a championship spot, not just a playoff spot. How far can they go? How can they really push for a championship? And I think when you look at the Dodgers and the Padres, I mean, those are the two best teams in the league, in my opinion, and you have them in the same division. I think that's really the most loaded division in baseball right now. Yeah, I mean, that's a good argument, but at the end of the day, they also benefit from getting to play a combined 57 games each against Diamondbacks, Giants, and the Rockies. Yeah. And those are teams that, that make it so much easier for them. And I think also those teams are disadvantaged because they have to play the Padres and the Dodgers. Yeah. I will make the argument that the Braves should be up there as one of the best teams in, in mm -hmm. the MLB. And I'm not even biased to the Braves. I just think they don't have a weakness. And, and that's, that's the thing with all of these teams in the NL East is that they're just so well-rounded, and even in places when they're not, like the Nationals, they struggle offensively besides Soto and Turner, even though they've brought in some bats like Bell and Schwarber. But their starting pitching is so good that yeah. they only need to get a couple runs on the board to reliably have a chance to win each game because that rotation is so great front to back. So, And it's the same way with, with every other team in terms of the one weakness that they maybe have, they have so many other strengths that make up for it that it doesn't take them out of contention, not only for winning the division, but also for being, I think, a championship contending team. I will argue that the Braves could absolutely contend to a contend mm -hmm. for a championship. The last time we played 162 games, the Nationals won, and they were the lowest team going into the playoffs yeah. that year, and they still took the title. So they've got resilience on that team. It was their pitching that got them through it. Of course, the Mets, I, everyone's high on Lindor right now. Mm -hmm. They brought him in, and I think I can expect him to be a big difference maker. Um, the Phillies re-signing Real Muto, Harper, obviously. Um, I just and, and, and the Marlins, they're kind of young and hungry, and they've got this like rebellious teenager vibe where they're like trying to fight their big brothers and fight out of it. Um, and of course, notable in the in the off season was Kim Ng, and they did um, compete for the. They won a playoff series last year. The Marlins did. Yeah. So I just think top to bottom. This is a top to bottom division. There's not a bad team in the division. They're all going to contend for that for a playoff spot. And once they get into the playoffs, I would expect NL East teams to have really, really high playoff success. Mm. I think it's your argument too that the Padres and the Dodgers have to play and kind of beat up on those lower teams in their division. I think really it's their there's, it's only helping their playoff success, just getting into the playoffs. Once they get to the playoffs, I mean, they're playing at whoever they have to play. They, they don't really care who it is. I think really just that, you know, they're beating up in the division is really just getting them to the postseason. I think once they get to the postseason, I think the Dodgers and the Padres are going to show that they are the best teams in the league and they're going to beat up on whoever they play. But to your point that 
I mean, really, the, that division is just top down, all five teams. But I think when you look at who's really fighting for the championship spot, and you you have to include the Dodgers and the Padres, and really say like these two teams are the best teams in the league, and really you have to look at those in that division. Yeah, absolutely. But even to your point, what you're saying. People look at the NL West and they see a two-headed monster. All mm -hmm. they see is LA and San Diego, and your argument is, is proof of that because that's what it's contingent on. With the NL East, you can't ignore any team in the NL East, not even the Marlins, who again are kind of like that little brother when they're in the spot to be fighting their way to the top. Yeah. You still can't count them out. You can't. They've got a great young team, um, and I think I, I really expect all, all of the teams in the NL East to contend. I, I just can't say it enough. There are five teams in the NL East that are all good teams vying for the playoffs and that could possibly all go above 500 with the NL West it's two mm -hmm. maybe the Giants contending for a wild card spot and that's being really generous yeah. so absolutely the Dodgers and the Padres that's the most anticipated matchup all all season they get 19 games together of course my favorite team the Diamondbacks is in the NL West we just did a four game series against the Padres and yep. it was horrible mm -hmm. it was the worst thing I've ever watched um, so I understand the the hype around them and of course they are great teams but most loaded division best division there's not a bad team in the NL East there are bad teams in the NL West and it pains me to say that it pains me to admit that but that's just the way that it is. Mm -hmm. Five is greater than two. That's the end of the argument for me. Yeah, I think really just for me, it's when I think of loaded, it's just how many teams are really vying for that championship spot. I agree with you. There are at least four teams, possibly five, in the, in the NL East that are contending for playoff spots. But I think really in the NL West, there are two teams that are vying for championship Absolutely. spots. So I think really in, that, in my opinion, that's what I looked at as loaded, is how many championship teams do I see? I see two there. I see maybe one in that division. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I guess we're just going to have to agree to disagree, but certainly lots of very exciting matchups to be coming out of both of these divisions. Um, I'm excited for the playoffs. Of course, it's looking like a great season so far. I know we're like five games in, but mm -hmm. in a 162 game stretch that we get back this year, I'm really excited to see how it goes for Same sure. Here. All uh, right. Well, yeah. we are going to send it over to a break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. In the racing world, Scott Dixon and Kevin Harvick are two of the best race car drivers this year. The NASCAR season is underway and I'm joined now by Emma House and Jerome Sweeney to debate on who is the better race car driver, Scott Dixon or Kevin Harvick. Well, first of all, I think we should both start out by saying racing is in fact a sport. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, there's just, there's, Scott Dixon's just been dominant for the last 20 years in the sport of IndyCar. Um, even before IndyCar, I guess, in his Indy Lights days, he was dominant too. Um, but I think just coming from New Zealand all the way to America and being one of the only, you know, foreign New Zealand, but you know, you are the face of New Zealand racing as Scott Dixon. You come over and you turn that into becoming one of the most successful IndyCar drivers of all time, winning uh, Indy 500, one of the, you know, most famous races um, in 2008. And, you know, following that up with, you know, he just year in and year out, he's top three in the standings. You know, he's winning uh, IndyCar championships left and right. Um, Scott Dixon's just, he's, he's kind of the man in IndyCar, I'd say. <laughs> well, I'm going to take the argument. Kevin Harvick is pretty dominant in NASCAR right now. I would say he is the best that they have out of current drivers. Um, he's got a couple of championships. Well, he's got one championship in the Cup Series in 2014. But he's had six championship four appearances in the last six seasons, seven seasons that he's had. Um, he is the third all-time NASCAR driver like winner with all of his combined series, which is 119. Pretty impressive. Um, Scott Dixon, yeah, he's great. He's got a couple of championships. He's got 50 wins, but Kevin Harvick's got 58. 
makes him right. So <laughs> and just for clarification, so the NASCAR season goes on for about four months longer and has about I think it's eighteen more races than IndyCar. So I mean, like statistically, like mathematically speaking, <laughs> Scott Di Scott Dixon is you know he's winning more races frequently than Harvick. But I mean, you also have to look into the fact that it is in fact a different sport, whereas Absolutely, in yeah. NASCAR they're running very closely. And as you see in IndyCar, when they touch, you know, it's crazy accidents, you know, very dangerous. As Scott Dixon in 2017, uh, Indy 500, he was, I think it was, uh, I think six inches away from uh, his head being uh, just smushed on that concrete barrier in that uh, accident. So. Thank God he's, you know, he made it out of that unscathed and unharmed because that just shows how dangerous, you know, how much of a sport racing really is when, you know, you're going 30 feet in the air at 200 miles an hour and landing six inches away from crushing your head. I mean, that's just, it's unheard of, you know, this the dangers that IndyCar does. That's just what makes, you know, Scott Dixon dominant is he goes out there and literally risks his life to just win championships. It's incredible at two, 230 miles an hour too. It's just takes guts to do that, and I don't think Kevin Harvick uh, could do that. I mean, Kevin Harvick goes 200 miles an hour, so... <laughs> Not 230, though. I will say, it is an extremely dangerous sport. They are both putting their lives on the line. Um, that being said, you know, there is the, the major differences between Indy and NASCAR. Right. I think one of them is NASCAR is more of like a typical car that you see, and Indy is like they're right. kind of laying down. And I, I, think, I think one of the big separations between the sports is um, NASCAR is centered around ovals, whereas IndyCar, mm -hmm. you know, you get you know, the, super speed, the super speedways in Indianapolis, Texas, uh, Sebring, and, you know, so it's, it's, very, it's very diverse, but also it's, it's kind of similar, and it's cool to see, like, NASCAR coming into the... Um, road schedule this year, whereas mm -hmm. um, Scott Dixon's the best road car, Indy car driver, hands down, whereas Kevin Harvick, we all know, uh, <laughs> Chase Elliott kind of has him in the road courses. So. He does have a, a hold on that. Um, I'm excited to see Kevin Harvick and what he does, though. He is out of NASCAR drivers. I mean, they call him the closer for a reason. This dude could be at the back of the pack, 40 cars in front of him at the middle of the race, and by, you know, 40 to go, He's a top 10, 30 to go, he's top five, and he stays there in the top five for the rest of the race. So I think it's no debate that he's the best NASCAR driver. Right, right, and I think, um, you know, Kevin Harvick, yeah, he's great, but I think the one cool part about NASCAR that IndyCar doesn't do is they do the stages, so it, you know, it, mm -hmm. it brings them back together for, um, you know, the end of the races and whatnot, so it makes it for a competitive finish, whereas in IndyCar, you see Scott Dixon wins a race by almost a minute, and he's, like, lapped everyone in the race, where it's yeah. just... So I think NASCAR gets the edge for the competitive advantage, and that makes Kevin Harvick, honestly, a better NASCAR driver than most other NASCAR drivers, because he's been there long enough, he's been there before. Um, they had the playoff uh, grouping stages, so mm -hmm. he knows uh, what it takes, and then, obviously, every NASCAR driver knows that they have a chance to come back, even if they... Um, hit a hit an accident or whatnot, but you know they can. It'll be one thing for sure. It'll be a very uh, interesting uh, race season this year, and uh, um, we'll throw it back over to Jacob. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us. As always, get on the Sided Debates app and Sided.co to put up your own debates, and be sure to give us a follow on social media at Take Aside KU. I'll be getting my COVID-19 vaccine next week, so I'm happy to announce that Max McElroy will be hosting next Tuesday's show. For all of us here at Take Aside, I'm Jacob Polachek and we'll see you again soon.